Well, this doesn't happen very often, does it? <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to start by wishing a very warm welcome to our friends from the Brick Lane Circle Company who've come up from London. Uh, they came up last night, they've been around market rating today. They're going to be talking to us and performing this afternoon. And uh, tomorrow they're off to St. Powers Castle as well, I believe. Oh, yeah. cool. yeah. So, very eventful weekend organised by the Friends of Market Rating Library, our volunteer group. So, a huge thank you to them for uh, mm -hmm. making this all come together. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to all of you for being drawn in by the East India Company and uh, no doubt declining to go to some other Arts Fest event that's on at the moment. I don't know. Um, obviously, it's of great interest to us in Market Rating Library. Um, so, I'm going to hand you over just now. And uh, maybe we could give a warm welcome, please, to the Brick Lane Circle. Thank you. Thank you, Alastair. Uh, my name is Mohammed Ahmedullah. I'm the secretary of Brick Lane Circle. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about our organization and some of the projects that we have been doing uh, and about uh, some of the work that we have been doing on the East India Company. And then I will invite some of the authors of the book here to, um, you know, one by one, to talk about their experience. And they will also do some reading from their particular story. And if you look at, you know, those boards, um, there's the board, uh, each book, so there's a board um, on each person, uh, each of the writers. And none of the writers uh, are like uh, established authors or previous, uh, you know, um, experience of in the publishing um, and uh, so this project um, you know publicized and we had such a you know, massive uh, interest and um, the people that we took on um, they age range from 69 to 21 yeah. and from different kind of uh, background um, so what i'm going to do now uh, well, this is the book cover this is where we are from um, this exhibition also has like a panel at east india company and there are some boards with uh, some, you know, give you details about uh, some of the things the East India Company do, you know. When you finish, we have some time, you might, you know, look, look around. Um, yeah, this was the flyer of this project, you know, when we started. Um, and this attracted, as I said, a lot of interest. I mean, our target was 12, you know, we had applications from 30 people. Normally, it's difficult to, you know, attract interest to even meet the target. Mm -hmm. uh, who we are, you know, Brickland Circle, uh, we set this organization up, uh, primarily focused at the uh, Bangladeshi community, you know, in, in the UK, especially in, in London. Uh, this was 10 years ago, and since then, the community has come a long way. Um, uh, improving in education, in economics, in, in many different fields. But can Excuse me, can you speak up? Oh, sorry, yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm from Britland Circle, and we set this organization up about 10 years ago, um, mainly focused on uh, the Bangladeshi community to see how we can help um, intellectual inner development of the community. Uh, mm -hmm. since, since then, you know, uh, our community has uh, progressed mm -hmm. and participating in many different fields, but the story wasn't... Um, like this, you know, 20, 15 years ago, and things are like progressing well. Uh, but also, one of the way of um, developing the community, because we live in this country, you know, different communities, so it's really important that we um, try and understand deeper roots, you know, that links us. So East India Company, you know, uh, since 16, early 1600, uh, went to India, and through the East India Company's effort, uh, we have become linked. And also through the East India Company and the British, uh, you know, Empire, um, you know, we got linked with other parts of the world. So it's very important to understand, you know, the deeper roots of uh, our connection. Uh, these are some of the projects, you know, that we've been running. Um, can you see? Mm -hmm. no, no. Okay, I won't go into detail, but these are some of the projects. <coughs> That, that we'll be running. One of the projects we ran, uh, sorry, what I, I'll just uh, say, in 2007, um, it was 250 years of anniversary of the Battle of Plassey, you know, when uh, the hero of this town actually took over 
Bengal, <coughs> and 250 years <coughs> anniversary was in 2007. So 2007, and uh, that time, um, myself and my friends and my colleagues, uh, we had very little knowledge of history. We didn't understand the connection. We didn't understand. We didn't know much about Robert Clive. We didn't understand how the British took over, how a small country, you know, far away, come by ships and take over a big country. It was like, uh, you know, mysterious, and it was important to understand, um, you know, how, how this kind of happened. And then in order to commemorate the uh, anniversary, we organized a conference, we organized East India Company Walk, you know, where East India Company used to operate from in, in, in London, and, um, and so on. And then later on, we were lucky to get some funding from the Heritage Luxury Fund to run a project involving young people. And so a group of young people spent um, about 15, 18 months researching on the city company and writing a book. And so this was the beginning of our uh, activity to do the city company. Part of the project involved us taking you know, young people on walks, you know, where the city company had various operations. Um, this chap. Uh, Nick Robbins, you know, he's a very nice uh, friend of ours. He's written a book called A Corporation That Changed the World. And it's a very nice book. And he volunteered to take us on walks and, and help us, you know, guide us and support us, advise us, and sometimes uh, you know, open doors for, doors for us. It's very important that we are ordinary people from the community. It's difficult sometimes to access, you know, experts and academics. Uh, this is a Cutler's House uh, warehouse, you know, uh, near Liverpool Street. This particular plaque uh, is no longer there anymore, I don't know why. And this is where we ended the war, East India Company War. It's part of the process of getting the young people to become uh, more interested in the East India Company and then use this interest, you know, to, uh, to try to do research and, 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 and so on. And this was the outcome, uh, the book that they produced. It's called Plus's Legacy. There's a copy in the museum, in the New Museum. And we launched this book at the London Docklands, the Museum of London in Docklands. And again, it was hugely kind of uh, popular. Lots of people came. And this is the celebration event, you know. And so this, now I will talk about this particular project. When we were running the, the Young People's Project, um, it was like more academic kind of oriented. We asked people to research and write chapters in a book. But then we came across a lot of people who wanted to engage more creatively, you know, like painting, drawing, uh, poetry, and uh, story writing, and so on. Um, but then uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, they don't fund you for creative projects. They fund you for heritage and a historical kind of project. So we had to think very hard. And, and we had to kind of come up with justification why a fiction writing project to do with history uh, could help people learn and communicate <coughs> and share heritage. Um, so we managed to get some funding. Um, and then, uh, again, I was saying earlier, we publicized and we got a lot of interest. Our, some of our partners were like London Metropolitan Archive, National American Museum, British Library, Victoria and Albert Museum, and Arts Without Border, they will be doing the performance here. Um, London Metropolitan Archive, they showed us, you know, some archival materials. They're not, um, they don't have too much on East India Company, but they still have uh, more than 600, uh, they, this is what they told us, 600 items to do with East India Company. Um, National American Museum uh, in Greenwich, I don't know if you know, they have opened a new gallery on East India Company. Mm -hmm. It's called Traders Gallery, and they have also got so much information and experts within the, you know, the museum uh, who have a lot of knowledge uh, on the East India Company. And obviously the British Library has so much records of the East India Company. And Victor and Albert Museum, they've got textiles and lots of objects that, that came to England through the East India Company. So basically what we did, we took uh, our, you know, people who joined us on visits to those places and we provided them with training on, you know, how to read old English handwriting, uh, you know, historical fiction writing, researching archives, archiving materials, and we also provided mentoring um, 
six months of mentoring from a fiction writer who met them every month, once a month, and also was uh, available uh, to communicate by, by, by internet. Um, okay, this was the project launch of this particular project. Again, you can see so many people came. And we're presentation from our partner institutions you know, to explain to the people what kind of materials that they have on this in their company. Uh, this is uh, looking at the British uh, library uh, materials. Uh, this is the National Maritime Museum, the Traders Gallery. Uh, this is British Library again, and that's the uh, London Metropolitan Archive. The idea was that uh, by exposing uh, uh, people to information and objects and sources of information and experts you know, on East India Company, uh, then they will somehow get uh, inspired or interested in a particular story. The project was called Human Stories on the East India Company. The book is called Untold Stories of the East India Company. And the idea behind this, the project name was for people to look at human stories rather than big institutional and big you know, events and you know, talk about you know um, all the all the big people and the big processes, and we wanted people to try and find ordinary people's uh, like uh, life stories or you know details about um, human interactions and, and so on. Um, we also ran family history workshop. It was very surprising when we publicized the project. I had so many emails, not hundreds. I mean, I'm talking about about ten from different people. This is one from uh, India, one from uh, New Zealand, and people are uh, saying they have Indian ancestry. <coughs> and um, there was one during the uh, opening, sorry, during the project launch, um, there was a white <coughs> man, I don't know where, I forgot where he came from, but he, 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 puts it, he put his hand up, and he said one of the Indian shipbuilders from Bombay was his grandfather, um, sorry, his uncle. So I was surprised, how can a you know, Indian be the uncle of a white man? Uh, but basically, he explained in you know, a later on. So, and other people who also contacted us, they say they've got Indian ancestry. One lady contacted us, and she thinks she's the descendant of an illegitimate daughter of uh, one of uh, Clive's companion, um, you know, in India, you know, who was also in the Battle of Plassey. The most surprising um, you know, person who contacted me there's a lady who is an academic at uh, Kent University. She's retired, but I think she's still engaged in uh, marking PhDs, <coughs> you know, examining PhDs. And she told me she's the um, descendant of Mir Jafar. Mm -hmm. Do people know Mir Jafar here? Yeah. So I was surprised. How can an English lady be descendant of Mir Jafar? Right? So she met me, uh, and we had a cup of tea and, and so on. Basically, what happened? Then the descendant of Mir Jafar, we still you know, inherited the title that the British allowed, you know, within the system. Um, still had a small army, uh, which they support, they support, they support the British, and they had their lands and so on. He came to England in 1870s to get redress from uh, England because Eastern, sorry, the British officers uh, in, in India was uh, um, uh, doing injustice to him. And while he was here, he fell in love with a 16-year-old English woman, and he had six babies with her, so she's descendant from that line. So there's so many, you know, interesting stories out there for people to kind of, uh, you know, learn about. Um, there were three, that's the lady, she was telling us about her uh, family history. And this guy who said his uncle was Indian, and, and so on. Just uh, the process, we're having some training there, the group. And this is the project launch. I'm uh, sorry, book launch at the end when we celebrated the achievement. Again, we had a huge number of people coming, you know, joining us. And so we are really lucky, you know, that um, Jim um, was happy, you know, for us to come here and and talk to uh, people in, in Market Drayton. I came to Market Drayton in 2010 when we were doing the Young People's Project to try and get some information. I wanted to take a picture of uh, Stites Hall, but I couldn't get there. I think I was blocked at uh, some private road or something, I couldn't find it. And uh, I think Robin from uh, the museum, he kindly offered, and he got me some pictures. For, so we included those pictures in the book. Um, 
So what I'm, what I will do now, I won't say uh, anymore. I'm going to invite some of the authors to come one by one to talk to you about their experience, and then um, um, you, can, you can ask them some questions if you want, uh, and then we'll have a performance. <coughs> can I invite Anita first, please? Since your name starts with A. <laughs> Good afternoon. Let me know if you can't hear me because I've got quite a quiet voice. Um, it is difficult. <laughs> okay, I'll really try. My story is called The Blue Eyed Girl and it's on page 39 if you want to have a look at it. I'll just explain a bit about the, the story. I wanted to write about an English woman who went to India. Luckily, I managed to find in the British Library the diaries of a woman called Eliza Fay, who travelled to India four times. And she was married to a man called um, Anthony Fay, who was a barrister who was going to work in the, um, in the service of the East India Company. But while he was in India, he had an illegitimate child, which was a boy, actually. Anyway, my story is a combination of um, historical fact and imagination. Because in my story, the child she had, that he had, was a girl. But what actually happened was that um, his wife, Eliza, decided after he, they'd broken up, they'd legally separated, that she would take on that child and bring him back to England. Unfortunately, he died on the voyage back. So in my story, the girl that she had, she brings back to England and sets up what she called a seminary, which is actually a school in Blackheath. So the story is from the point of view of Eliza, sorry, not Eliza, her daughter, Mary, who she, ch she changed her name from Pavati to Mary. So she learns about her mother's history from the, the diary she's read. The one, same ones that I read in the British Library. So I'll start off with um, some little extracts and I'll just, you know, try and keep going at different points in the story. Eliza Fay's first journey to India began in 1779 when she set sail from England with her newly wedded husband, Anthony Fay. They travelled overland through France, Italy, Greece and Turkey. It was an edifying tour of pleasure and discovery, and they, they enjoyed the well-known cities and sites of those countries. But their voyage onwards from the Hellespont to Egypt and thence to India was beset with peril, hardship, sickness, and captivity. But Eliza faced all these trials with courage and fortitude. I take up her narrative from when she arrived in Egypt which was then a very dangerous place for English travellers. We arrived yesterday at Suez from Grand Cairo after a journey of three days over a most dreadful desert where every night we slept under the great canopy of heaven and where we were every hour in danger of being destroyed by troops of, Arabi of Arabian robbers. After six weeks at sea, they approached Calicut. Calicut on the east coast would be a short stop, so she believed, before they would be on their way to Bengal. It was a relief for Eliza to sight the Malabar Hills from the deck of the Natalia as it sailed into Calicut on the 28th of November, 1779. It was, it was to be the first time she would set foot on Indian soil. But scanning the coast for the familiar sight of the British flag, Eliza's hopes faltered. As they drew nearer the shore, her instincts told her that something was very far amiss. Many flying reports of hostilities having actually commenced between Haida Ali and the English, should this really prove true, our fate will be sealed for life. Haida Ali was the prince of Mysore and had already been at war with the English in 1770, and Calicut was in his possession, where he had appointed Suda Khan, his brother-in-law, as governor. 
what happened then was they were taken captive by Haider Ali's soldiers and they were held for 13 weeks. So I've gone on to page 42, the last paragraph. Eliza and her husband remained captives for 13 weeks, during which time they attempted to escape disguised as two French sailors. But their efforts were thwarted when the boatman, whom they had bribed, failed to turn up at the appointed place. They could only travel if granted a passport by Souda Khan, who tormented them by repeatedly delaying their requests and obstructing their attempts to grant them an audience. <coughs> Finally, on the 19th of February, 1780, they were released into a happy state of liberty. Skip on a bit. Next page. It was on the 1st of May, 1780, after their voyage of nearly a year, when Eliza and Anthony Fay finally sailed along the Nine Mile Reach into Calcutta. What a difference from when they first set foot on Indian soil. How welcome it was to behold the splendid houses, palaces, groves and gardens that lined the esplanade. Eliza drank in the scenery. She gazed at the grand houses, the elegant mansions surrounded by lawns that extended to the water's edge. She could see fashionable ladies taking the air in carriages as they promenaded along the river. A bit further down. The cracks in the marriage actually began fairly quickly. Mr. Fay insisted that I take into my employ a Hindu female. I agreed that I fancy he was more taken with her charms than her fitness for service. It became a point of vexation between us. I wish these people would not vex one by their tricks, for there is something in the mild countenance and gentle manner of the Hindus that <coughs> interests me exceedingly. Sita was the name of her maidservant. Like many of the English mistresses, Eliza could not see that her luxury and ease was at the expense of the Indians who served her. To her mind, all native servants were lazy, thieves, and Mohammedans tiresome because they refused to touch a plate on which pork had been laid. And so her preference was for Hindus. But even so, she did not trust Sita. A little later, one day Eliza noticed that she'd been charged for a gallon of milk and 13 eggs and demanded Sita account for the excess eggs. When Sita claimed it was needed for custard, Eliza accused her of stealing. Sita denied the charge, but Eliza lost her temper and threatened to dismiss her. There was a big commotion when Sita fell to her knees, begging for another chance, and Eliza tried to push her towards the door. Sita must have known then that she was already with child. A hungry belly always leads to lies. Mr. Fay came to her rescue and insisted that as master of the house, he would have the last word, and he refused to cast her out and so she remained for a few more months. Mr. Fay's fortunes did not improve. On the 17th of August, 1780, at Belvedere House, a duel was fought between Warren Hastings, the Governor General of Bengal, and Philip Francis, one of the four councillors on the Bengal Council. Mr. Francis accused Hastings of corruption, and so Hastings had to defend his honour. Anthony Fay took the side of Philip Francis and on that choice his future hung. Francis fired the first shot but missed. Hastings fired and wounded Francis in the shoulder. Hastings was relieved that his injury was not fatal, but honour demanded that Francis end his stay in India, and so he returned to England. Around that same time, Eliza decided she would go to the market because she was, they were getting pretty hard up for money because uh, Mr. Fay was not getting any work as a barrister. He was not very good at his job. When she was in the market, she, she saw Sita. This is in the second paragraph. She approached the, the store where an elderly lady with white hair sat behind a table. The aroma of the spices was enticing, and as she drew nearer, she saw Sita with a bundle tied to her back. Just then, the older lady held out her arms and Sita handed a young baby to her. When Eliza approached, Sita quickly took the child back. Salam and salam, she greeted her former mistress. 
Is this your child? Eliza asked. Sita nodded. Eliza took the baby in her arms. Oh, this is Mary Face speaking. She saw that my skin was as pale as milk and my limbs were thin and pale too. But it was my eyes, my blue eyes, that told her always beyond doubt that I was the child of Anthony Faye. And she thought of the stolen milk and eggs, nourishment for the child that my mother had been conceiving. So then it was all over for the marriage. And Eliza was very resourceful. She went to a lawyer, this is on the page 46, and she made her plans. She went to see a lawyer and her husband was summoned to his office where a deed, deed of separation was drawn up that he was obliged to sign. They left their house. Mr. Fay returned all their furniture and Eliza moved to the household of Lady C. This is uh, Mary speaking again. My father went back to England alone. He never saw me, but Eliza demanded that he leave 30 rupees as a token of his paternity. This money was conveyed with all discretion to my mother, Sita. It was the price he paid to disown me. He died in 1812 bankrupt and intestate, and so Eliza did not have to pay his debts. For the next three years, Eliza often thought about the blue-eyed girl that he left behind and wept for that child as well as for her own child that would never now be born. And then through fate and fire and her own conscience, she became the mother of the child that Anthony Fay had discarded. And you never wrote before, Anita? I've, I've written... Um, yeah, I've been writing creatively. I was writing a, a full-length novel, which I finished this year, which took me four years to write. But this was a completely different challenge because I, I was really scared. I just thought, I don't know how to do research. And I just thought, I'm not going to be able to do this project. <laughs> and you've done it. And I'm really pleased that I stuck it out. Does, does your seat at a time with the other story, seat a circle? No. It's just a real coincidence? Story. That's a really good story. Really I've read a bit of that one. It's a bit of a pop <laughs> Thank you. One more. Yes. What is the emotional pleasure you get from learning about the East India Company and India? I think it's more an intellectual pleasure because yes. I studied. Does it sound very emotional? Well, because I think this is an emotional story. It's yes. about you know, a child being abandoned, a mixed race child, and. You know, that's that's the kind of thing that interests me because I've got mixed race children. But it, I, it's only just occurred to me. But I think because I studied history and learnt nothing about India, and then when my son went to university a few years ago, and he was writing a, an essay on the East India Company, and I had no idea how important they had been in the history of the British Empire and the history of India, and so. It was great to have that chance to learn more, you know, to read around the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. My story is called The Prophecy, and it's on page 165. Uh, this is a story which is actually related, I mean the story comes from certain childhood memories if you like. Uh, it's, uh, I'm Tamil, and an Indian Tamil. And on my mother's side, my family comes from Tiruchirappalli, which is where the first Mysore War, second Mysore War, third Mysore War, and fourth Mysore War all happened. And that was really in that area and region. So there are a lot of stories from family, from people in our villages, people, you know, who, who have, there's a lot of uh, stories that, that we grew, grew, grew up with. 
And on my father's side, I come from a place called Tanjau, which is not very far from there. And when we were growing up, there used to be a story. There's a, there's a temple, which we call the Ayanar Temple. Now, the Ayanar temples are not the kind of temples you will see if you go to South India as a tourist. Because these are not temples that are built by kings to celebrate victories with long steeples and carvings and paintings and all the grandeur. These are temples that are made by local peasants and artisans. And they are usually made clay structures. And they are clay figurines of various local gods, goddesses, animals. All the things that peasant communities value, if you like. And these temples have always fascinated me much more than all the big temples. Uh, and uh, of course, if you're a child, that temple is much more liberating because there are no rules there. People don't tell you, don't sit there, don't talk loudly, don't giggle, you know, which as a child, it's, it's uh, so, you know, I always liked those temples much more. And there's a story that, uh, there's a very famous Ayanar temple on the boundaries of Tajau. And these temples are always, they mark the village boundary. So, you know, it's uh, when you come to an Ayanar temple, you know you've come to a new village. And that's the marker. And there's this famous temple in Tanjau, which is famous because there is a story that Robert Clive was injured and nearly died in the Battle of Arcot. And they brought him to the to the Sayanar <coughs> temple. And the deity of that temple actually cured him. And so this nearly dead man came to life and then went on to become, you know, what he became because he went then went to Bengal and that's where his rise, his rise in his career starts. So it's a yeah, very young Clive. He comes to Madras, then he gets into this his first uh, engagement, military engagement, and then he nearly dies, and there is a story which has always fascinated me because, I mean, I used to think when I was growing up, uh, what if the goddess hadn't saved him that day? You know? Why did she save an Englishman when all her, because she's supposed to protect the peasants in that village, right? And the, uh, the, the workers and the people of that village. So there were all these questions. And when I saw, you know, I'm with the Lewis, uh, ad for, would you like to write a story? I kind of jumped at it. But I didn't think there was any history to it. I mean, this was just folk story. There's no, you know, thing. And I said, well, I'll cheat a little bit and I will tell the story as if it was a historical story. Mm -hmm. So it really, and I really loved being part of this project. Uh, firstly, I met wonderful people and uh, it gave me a chance to write. But uh, also, you know, it's that childhood story which I could actually put pen to paper and make something out of it. So that's, that's the background to it. I thought I'll just read a little bit from uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about Dubashis. Dubashi is literally a person who speaks two languages. And I suppose in contemporary Hindi or into English translation, we would call them interpreters or translators. But a Dubashi, Dubashis were much more than just translators because they were the ones who made business deals, who brought, made, you know, made business deals happen because the East India Company, the local traders, the man, you know, textile manufacturers, they put them together. They often got commissions out of that. They were go-between in many, many ways. So, you know, they were go-between between the rulers, the local powers, the landlords, the traders, artisans. So they were much more than just translating between languages. And so that is Adubashi. <coughs> And you may find many Indians who have the surname Dubashi. And so if you meet somebody called a Mr. or a Mrs. or a Miss Dubashi, then you know that their family has some history that goes back 
So I just thought I'll read a bit here from, uh, because we are in Wales, and so I thought yeah. I'll read a bit. Yeah. 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 It's very close. But it is Robert Clive's, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. near enough, yes. Um, I, I thought I would read some, a bit that concerns this part of, not, not London side of this side. Or, um, so this is about uh, the main character who is Vijayappa and who is a Dubashi to Robert Clive. And Robert Clive was very close to him and he was very fond of him also. So Vijayappa's grandfather, Bairi Rangappa, had been Elihu Yale's personal Dubashi. Yale used the company's money and bid successfully for a personal grant in his name from the king of Tanjau for the use of 12 villages around Kadalur. There he set up a trading post and built a fort for the factory, which he named Fort St. David after the patron saint of his native Wales. Mm -hmm. A black flag with a yellow cross was hoisted and fluttered on the fort. The fort on the Coromandel coast came to be known as Tyranny's Den. Yale taxed anyone he could for anything he could and publicly flogged anyone who did not pay up. One day, a stable boy was strung to a tree and skinned alive on suspicion of stealing a horse. 3,000 people from neighboring villages stormed the fort, torching Yale's palace, the homes of white settlers, the warehouses with cotton bales, spices and goods from England, the ammunition store, the offices, together with records and files, the treasury and much shells. Even Bairi Rangappa's house was not spared. His body was so charred that the family priest declared no cremation rites were possible. Rangappa's wife was pregnant with Vijayappa's father at the time. Since that day, locals hear plaintive cries of, Spare me, Governor Aya, spare me. I did not steal your horse. I am innocent. Spare me a year, please. I beg you. Through Fort St. David from time to time. Yale was recalled to Madras by the company's chiefs in London. So I'll just go skip a little bit there and go on to uh, when, you know, Christ, um, uh, Barry, his father, which I don't know, <coughs> read a bit about his injury. So which is on page 167. His father Bairi Rang, uh, no, uh, Vijayapa waited in the yellow and blue patchwork tent pitched on the northern boundary of Devi Kotai, 12 miles inland from Fort St. David towards Tanjau. For three days Vijayapa heard cries of dying horses, shrill orders, men shouting out to their gods, shrieks from stabbings, and the wild calls of death. Cries from the battlefield in Devi Kote became ambient sound and Vijayapa threw his head back on the cushions and stretched his legs. His eyes closed. He could hear his father's melodious voice singing Raga Kodi. <coughs> his father Bairi Anandappa, son of the of father who left his son of a father who left this world without cremation rituals, disliked his job as a Dubashi in Fort St. George in Madras. Instead, he developed a passion for the stories of an English writer from Emperor Akbar's times called William Shakespeare. <laughs> Anandapa composed Shakespeare's story in Tamil verse and wandered the streets of Black Town singing them in different ragas. Although Anandapa's English was excellent, as excellent as his Tamil, the officers at Saint George, Fort St. George stopped hiring him as a Dubashi because they thought he was insane. As a child, Vijayapal loved to hear his father sing Shakespeare stories. Vijayapal inherited from his father his love for music and the Bairi name, a name that had purchased with, his, with the company's officers. His <coughs> great-grandfather, Bairi Timapa, was the first Dubashi to translate from English. 
on his way from his native Telugu country in search of new opportunities in the Tamil country, Timmapwa came upon a convoy of English traders. Their chief, Francis Day, befriended him. Along the way, Timmapwa learned English from Day and became the first English-speaking Dubashi on the Coromandel coast. Also, the first to set up home across the road from White Town when Francis Day established the township next to Fort St. George in 1640. I'll skip a bit again and go to uh, the battlefield where he, Robert Clive is injured. Uh, that's on page 169. John Miller was bent over Robert, lying on a bamboo stretcher. Robert was bleeding profusely. Bring me opium, quick! Opium, shouted Miller, without turning around. Robert made no attempts to muffle his shrieks or control his screams. Vijayapa, save me, Robert shouted. Opium, please, Miller waved to those around him. Not many believed Miller was a real doctor. Four English merchants turned uh, warriors helped to hold down Robert as Miller tied cloth bandages above the wound to stop the bleeding. The men could see the ruptured sinews. Robert's arm turned blue as the knot tightened. There was a deep gash across his cheek and slashes on his wrist. Only you can save me, Vijayappa, Robert screamed in agony. I need to stitch his wounds. Opium, please. Miller was desperate. Robert's health fell to, fell to one side. He was unconscious. Vijayappa turned to the brown, bare-bodied, and to the brown bare bodies encircling the white ones. Who is a Tangerian amongst you? Did you hear what I said? Who is a Tangerian amongst you? I know that there is an INR temple that marks the boundary of Tanjore city. I may be Telugu, but I know the Tamil country well. Mother Mariamman of that temple is known throughout the Tamil country. She heals anyone who comes to her, even Tanjaur's enemies. And Robert Ayer will go to her. Tanjaur city is very far, Beri Ayer. <coughs> At least 70 miles to the interior. Big forest on the way. Wild animals at night. Shut up, you idiots. You eat the company's salt, right? Vijayapa shouted. Can someone bring me bandages, please, and opium, and hot water, please? Miller was barely audi audible. Go immediately. Find me 16 palanquin bearers who can run really fast. Fetch me the company's palanquin. Find me four torch bearers. Make sure the mashaldars have enough replacement torches. Fit out a second palanquin with food and water. Carry Robert Aya. Be careful with the stretcher. Take him to the company's palanquin. Now, go. We have we, we leave now. Understand? Vijayapa went round the circle. He pre pressed a gold pagoda in each man's hand and closed their fist around them. What are you doing? I'm strugg struggling to save his life here. You take him away in this condition? Where to? Some sorcerer? Some voodoo chap? Miller looked incredulously at Vijayapa. Robert Ayer has asked me to save his life. The men lifted the stretcher into the palanquin. <coughs> Vijayapa got in. The battle cries on the plains of the Devi Kota receded. Gusty winds of the type seen only in Tamil month of Ani swirled, sucked up the leaves and dust and swept them over the company's palanquin. The Ani winds wailed. Spare me, Governor Ayer. Spare me. I did not steal your horse. I am innocent. Spare me, please. I beg you. Next question. Anybody? <coughs> no question? I think, yeah. You mentioned that um, <coughs> he was singing in a raja. What's, what's that? A raga is like a composition, uh, I suppose you would call. Uh, if you, it is a musical composition, which has certain ascending notes and descending notes. So raga thodi will have seven ascending <coughs> notes that are all pure full notes and that sort of thing. Yeah. So each 
Raga, there's a name to each Raga. And Tori is one where there are full seven notes ascending and descending. Mm -hmm. Any other one? Okay, can I invite uh, Fiona? No. Hello everyone. Um, I, my story isn't based on one particular individual. Um, when I started researching for my story, um, it took me forever to, to land upon what the story was going to be about. But gradually through the researching various things, um, something came out and, and that's what I sort of based my story on. I suppose it's, 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 the idea of the story started off when I was at the British Library, um, which uh, holds the East India Company records. Uh, and amongst those records, there are minute books. And I was quite interested to see that um, the, the directors had been discussing a situation where, uh, I think it was um, some soldiers from Sri Lanka had been uh, moved over to Kolkata and they had brought their Sri Lankan partners with them to Kolkata, but that was highly unusual and their, uh, sort of the, um, whoever was in charge of them had been censured for, for doing that. And then that sort of made me start thinking about people sort of going to and from countries and, and sort of, so it sort of sort of flowed from, from there, but I was picking up little bits of information sort of here, there and everywhere, including about um, Thackeray, who was born in India and his father worked in India and he sort of made a journey back to the UK. So I think that probably influenced my thinking. My story's called A World Apart and it's on page 67. Sitting on deck, makes me drowsy. The brilliant sun plays on my skin and feels good as it warms my bones. The sky above is an azure blue without a cloud to be seen. I watch as the sails billow overhead, gentle breezes guiding us ever onwards. I catch a movement out of the corner of my eye and turn to see flying fish skimming over the surface of the sea, the sunlight turning their bodies into a shimmering rainbow. There's the mellow sound of a harp in the background. My name is Samuel Hutchins. I'm 18 and I'm on my way to a new life in London. I found passage on the Buckingham, an East Indiaman built in the Bombay shipyards and secured accommodation in the great cabin. My cabin is cramped, but comfortable enough. It has a porthole for me to look out of, but I prefer to sit on deck taking in fresh air and conversing with some of my fellow passengers. We are fed and watered more than adequately and attentive ser servants take care of our every need. We are a few days out of Kolkata and the farewell to my mother is still vivid in my mind. My father was a merchant in the East India Company and married into a vast fortune thanks to Mama's considerable dowry, her being the granddaughter of a wealthy merchant who was a close friend of the great Robert Clive. My father, who was charismatic and popular amongst the bigwigs, was known for his generosity and spent lavishly. We lived in a big house in Alipur in Calcutta, which was richly decorated and furnished. My clothes were of the finest fabrics, Dakar muslins, Balakari silks, cottons. Servants, servants indulged me in my ayah and Nandi, who had been my nursemaid from infancy, cared for me as if I were her own. I remember how my father would say to me, son, one of these days you will join me in the East India Company and you can look forward to a secure and prosperous future. Despite the sun's warmth, a chill comes over me as I remember how quickly all this changed. One day, Mama and I were sitting drinking pico tea on the veranda overlooking the landscaped gardens. What a beautiful day it is, Samuel. In the background, the sound of fountains blended with the soft breeze blowing through the jack and mean trees. Suddenly, our peace and tranquility were shattered by the sound of galloping horses. Father's friends, their faces drawn and shocked, arrived in front of us. Mrs Hutchins, the most dreadful news. Your husband has been killed by a rogue elephant. Mama's face paled. She let out a scream and fainted. My beloved father was gone, leaving Mama a widow and me without a father. 
Father's funeral was a grand affair at St. Peter's in Fort William, and my chest puffed up with pride when I heard the tributes to him. Afterwards, I went with Mama to the reading of the will. Mr. Spencer, an elderly gentleman with white hair, looked solemnly over the top of his glasses. He seemed flustered and was finding it difficult to get his words out. Madam, I regret to say that your husband has left many debts, and once you've paid them, there will be little money left. Mama was at her wit's end. How did this happen, and how could we survive? Very quickly, the servants were let go, including my own beloved Anandi. Um, and then, so basically, his mother marries a, a, a family friend who basically doesn't have any time for poor Samuel um, and makes suggestions that Samuel should go to London to find his future, to find his grandmother, who, who lives in London, um, and to make, uh, to, to make his own way in life and to hopefully make a fortune, I suppose. Um, so the book starts with him being on the boat, um, four months on, he arrives in London and having left sort of a beautiful warm sort of climate, sun in the sky, with him being full of hope of the opportunities that may be ahead, he arrives in London four months on, on a cold spring day in 1819. It is mid-morning and I'm shivering on the deck of the Buckingham. Raindrops are dripping down the back of my collar and I look in vain for the sun in the sky. The ship is fast approaching back will reach. I'm the only passenger on board now. My family's standing, giving me the power to negotiate to disembarking at Blackpool rather than at Gravesend, which is further down um, uh, the Thames, uh, where the other passengers had said their farewells. All the disagreements of the long, troublesome journey had been put to one side as we wished each other well and promised to meet again. I give thanks for my safe arrival, but then grumble, what is this place? There is no sun, the sky is grey, the buildings are grey, people's faces all around are grey, their clothes are grey. And what's that strange smell? I can smell spices, but it's mixed with dampness, fog, rain and grey. I want to run and turn, uh, turn and run, but where to? The journey here has been perilous, long and uncomfortable, and who knows when I'll be able to find a boat back, and more importantly, find the money to pay for the ticket. A shiver runs down my spine again, as I think of the comfortable nest I've been tipped out of, and the unasked for adventure I've been pushed into. Um, so he then goes um, onto land, um, onto dry land, and find somewhere to, to stay. Um, he sets out the next day to try and find his, his grandmother, but he uh, gets led astray by, by a local who has promised to um, take him to where his grandmother lives. Um, but it turns out he has more uh, interest in, in the money that Samuel has in his, his wallet. Um, after what feels like a lifetime, we arrive in a disused dock area it's dank, dilapidated, and all around there are malnourished people with skin like parchment and glassy eyes. There's a labyrinth of lanes and alleyways. We cross rickety bridges over reeking ditches, which set the nostrils twitching. As we walk along, people barge into us and look at me strangely, whispering. There's a sense of despair and a smell of disease and damp fills the air. My hackles rise and my heart palpitates in the sickness of fear. I whisper, to Grimston, his, um, his guide. I don't like this. Hearing my words, Grimston says reassuringly, don't worry, you'll be safe with me. Um, <coughs> after turning a few more corners, a group of drunken young men bar our way. One of them, the tallest, pushes to the front and snarls, where do you think you're going? <coughs> Look at these Charlies, lads. They're looking a bit lost. So Grimston, the guide, replies in a steady voice, we're looking for Port Lane, young sirs. Pray let us pass. The ruffian sniggers. Well, you ain't going to find it here, matey, and you ain't going to go any further, forward or back, without making a contribution to our expenses. I tighten my fists and jump my chin forward. What expenses? Our expenses for ensuring your safe passage. Staring threateningly at me, he says, where are you from? Not around here, that's for sure. Look at them fine crab shells on his feet, he points at some of his fashionable shoes. So I'll stop just there because... So basically, that sort of continues. Um, all, all of a sudden, someone comes out of the shadows and comes to his help. And it turns out 
that it was um, a young Lascar who had been on the boat and it's fiction, so just by chance he happens to be in the same area. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go on a little bit later because um, so the so Jagjit, the, the Lascar helps him fight off the, the bad guys. They, they don't find Samuel's grandmother, um, but Samuel takes Jagjit back to the boarding house where he's staying, uh, and the Mrs. Bryant um, very kindly um, sort of offers Jagjit a, a place to stay. So I'm just going to finish now with a bit where there's a comparison of Jagjit and, and Samuel's um, time on the boat. Um, let me see. So Mrs. Bryant is, is interested to hear about the voyage to England. Um, and Samuel says, well now, Ms. well now, Mrs. Bryant, I wouldn't want to put you off the idea of travel. But although the beginnings of the journey started pleasantly enough with calm weather, a flat sea, fresh food and good company, that didn't last for long. My room was in the great cabin where many of the gentlemen were accommodated. I had a window, but during storms it had to be screened off to try and stop water coming in. Though oftentimes that didn't work and the sea washed into my cabin. I can't tell you the number of times my belongings ended up swimming around the cabin whilst I huddled on top of my bed. And I've already told you of the unpalatable meals we were given once the storms had taken our provisions. So far as my companions went, they were friendly enough at the beginning, but as time passed, there was more and more arguments, and life on board became more and more tedious. Jagjit says, but sir, that was luxury compared to our quarters down below, which were dank and dark. We were cramped in between the stores and trunks, kept working day and night, and the food you were given towards the end was what we had to survive on for the whole journey. Samuel says, I heard conditions were dreadful the further into the bowels of the ship that you went. Uh, how did you all fare down below during that horrendous storm off the coast of Helena? Because the ships from um, from England to sort of India and sort of vice versa would often stop off at St. Helena to take on more, more stores. Um, so, um, all right, so yeah, I, I heard conditions were dreadful. The further you went into the bowels of the ship, you went. How did you all fare down below during that horrendous storm off the coast of St. Helena? We were all quite ter terrified by that we wouldn't come out of it alive. Jadjik shudders at the memory. We were thrown from side to side all night long, and the boat was listing alarmingly. That's when we lost a lot of the stores and the passengers' luggage. I was surprised we came out of that all right. Uh, and then Mrs. Bryant is a bit concerned because she's just hearing all these negative things and so um, and so Samuel said yes but when weather was pleasant we were able to sit on deck and see marvellous things. We saw schools of dolphins and whales, flying fish and beautiful sunrises and sunsets. We went ashore at the uninhabited Ascension Island and turned turtles over to get at their eggs. And talking of St Helena we stopped there to make repairs to the boat and take on provisions. We were able to leave the ship and one of my fellow passengers took a group of us past Longwood House where we glimpsed that scoundrel Napoleon Bonaparte living in exile. Um, but I'll, I'll just stop there. I think I'd, I wanted to give a sense of what the journeys may have been like. And a part of the project um, sort of made, made me aware of, and all of us aware of the diaries that exist at the National Maritime <laughs> Museum, um, at the British Library. And there's just so, packed full of, of detail about what the journeys were and how perilous the journeys were. Um, I read about, I think there was one young woman, or um, a father and his two daughters, and they'd survived going back and forth from the two continents a, a number of times, but on the last journey there was, uh, the ship went down and they were mm. lost. So it's, um, and it just sounded, it, it, it sort of, Sounded as though it started off really sort of nicely on the boat, but then things, depending on what happened, there were storms and things like that. And um, I think it was a bit more, yes, un uncomfortable and unpleasant. And if you can imagine being with the same group of people for well, like sort of four months or something, then um, it's great if we all get on, but if you don't, then no way to escape. But anyway, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Would you like to continue Samuel's story, perhaps in volume two of Untold Stories? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I'm going to tell you about the ending of my story, but that's a possibility. <laughs> Cliffhanger. <laughs> Can I invite Nina, please? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. It's a full house. It's um, very nice to see you all. Um, just going to very briefly talk about how I got involved with the Brick Lane Circle. Um, I worked in Tower Hamlets in East London, where the Brick Lane Circle is based. And I saw an ad, like everyone else, and I was intrigued by the East India Company because I'm a product of the British education system and I didn't know anything about the East India Company. Uh, my background is Indian, my parents were born in Calcutta and I didn't know anything about the history and I felt quite ashamed and a bit embarrassed. So I went along to the event and it was a massive launch, there was over 100 people there and I thought there's no way I'm going to get selected but I'll give it a go and I applied and I got on the project and I'm delighted I got on the project because it's been a really fascinating journey, um, you know, going to places like the British Library, the London Metropolitan Archives, and really engaging with primary sources like diaries and letters, and really moving stories of people and their untold stories, which is of course what this anthology is called. So it was really fascinating. And also it was very timely. Um, my dad had passed away about six months before the project had started, and I wanted to reconnect with my history and my background. And he, you know, he used to tell me about Robert Clive and you know his background in Calcutta and I really wasn't that interested in. And and after passing away, I thought, well no, I need to find out more about my background and my heritage, reconnect to, to my dad almost in, in some way. So that's what got me involved. But in terms of the research, it was kind of overwhelming. There were so many stories, the breadth of history is immense. I was kind of overwhelmed by the research. Where do I start? And fortunately, somebody in the group had a book called The Last Mogul by William Danny Rimpo. I don't know if anyone's was it. And it ch charts the um, Indian mutiny and the decline of the Mogul dynasty. Now, I knew about the Mogul dynasty. You know, you probably know about the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you know, it's power based. But people don't really know how it declined. And I was intrigued that the Indian mutiny and the decline of the East India Company mirrored the decline of the Mughal dynasty. So that's really what kind of attracted me to the story. So my story, um, it's on page 151, and it's called Checkmate Deliberately. It's, it is basically the story of the last Mughal and his decline. And I called it Checkmate Deliberately because he was a really enigmatic man. He was in his 80s when this story kind of um, starts what well, it's a short story, but essentially it's about his refuge. Now this is at the tail end of the Indian mutiny, when you know there's a massive carnage across India, and um, this Mughal emperor Zafar, his power base was so diminished, he was called the king of Delhi because that's where he, his power was now was no, solely in Delhi. It had diminished so far. So this story charts his um, he sought refuge after the Indian mutiny. Because the rebels and the sepoys thought of him as a mascot of the Indian mutiny. The British thought he was a dangerous rebellion leader. And Zafar, who was in his 80s, wasn't interested in anything. He wasn't interested in politics. He wanted a quiet life. He was interested in chess. He was an accomplished Urdu poet. And he just wasn't interested. But he was stuck in the middle of these two camps. And at the end of the Indian mutiny, he was... Uh, considered dangerous by the British. So he and his, his uh, servants and a number of rebel sepoys, they all escaped outside Delhi in a place called Humayun's tomb, which is a tomb built by his ancestor. And he sought refuge in, in, in the tomb and his um, supporters encamped around in the gardens. So my story is about that refuge and what happens to him. I'm not gonna tell you what happens to him. I've got the anthology now, so you can find out. But I'm just going to read a few paragraphs. Just Essentially, they just set the scene um, in Hormayun's tomb. So, I mean, I'll be very brief, but it's just... So you get a flavour. So, this is page 151, and there's a quote, which Emperor, this is from Emperor Zafar himself. Whoever enters this gloomy palace remains a prisoner for life. 
Little Mines II, Delhi, 1857. The once manicured gardens of Charbagh were now a ramshackle series of vegetable patches, makeshift tents, and fires heating an assortment of smoking pots and pans. The formerly paved walkways, decorative fountains, and interconnecting lawns had become spindly tufts of parched grass that housed the palace guards, rebel sepoys, refugees, servants, and jihadis. The soothing flow of the garden's watercourses were now dry, but the small pools of stagnant water. Bloodthirsty mosquitoes thrived on these static pockets of water, as well as on the stateless mass of life that had now congregated on these grounds. Despite the large numbers in this walled commune that encircled the faded grandeur of Humayun's tomb, a subdued atmosphere pervaded the twilight hours. There was little noise or chatter, and what occasional conversation occurred revolved around the tending of the thirsty horses on the grounds, as well as the meager vegetarian <coughs> diet that satisfied few in the camp. Pots and pans bubbled and hissed on fires, and the smoky smell of cumin and turmeric wafted through the chilly air. The once impassioned discussions about a free India, free from the British and free from carnage, had long evaporated. Months of dwindling supplies and limited water, poor sanitation, living with men from different religions, castes and creeds, all of this had created new conflicts, enemies and schisms in the camp. Many felt a sense of foreboding. They believed it was a matter of time before they were captured or slaughtered by the unrepentant British. This impending threat only widened divisions within this fraternity. The religious, social, and military differences that were once held in check by a tacit allegiance to Emperor Zafar were now unraveling. Many accused the emperor of weakness and indecisiveness. These voices were subdued on this particular night by fatigue, a sudden drop in temperature, and a quiet sense of despair. The men cursed as they swatted the mosquitoes from their faces. Many wrapped themselves in blankets that covered their frame uniforms as the night air brought a chill after the intense heat of the day. Some stared listlessly at the crackling fires and sizzling pots, waiting for the inevitable, the inescapable. No one discussed the morning or looked forward to the warmth of the sun. So that sets the scene. And, um, yeah, and uh, that's what I can really tell you about the story, but please feel free. <laughs> to, and it's not a happy ending, I'm afraid. Probably, yes. <laughs> Shame, but, um, but it's, it's true, and people don't know about it. And this is the beauty of the anthology, because we're documenting stories that people have forgotten or never documented because they weren't considered important. So I hope you enjoy the stories, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Now, I'm interested that, that you referred to the, the incident at the time as the Indian Newton. Yeah. Surely it was the War of Liberation in your side, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's open to interpret. The Indian Mutiny is, is what um, it's been called historically, yeah, but, but you're quite right. The trouble it's... is the victors write the history. Yeah. Yes. And, and yes. therefore, in that sense, looking at it from the other side, you, and you not the, the Indian nation, were fighting for their own liberation. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're quite right. Yeah, it's been branded in a certain way, and uh, yeah, it should be. It should be. Yes. Is it? Is, is the whole thing taught in the Indian school? Um, I don't know because I wasn't educated in India. I mean, is it taught in India? I'm not sure. What I know, I think more and more people, historically, <laughs> even in India, subcontinent, they would use the term, you know, uh, Indian mutiny. But like more and more people now are actually using something else in a war of independence. Yeah. I personally have problem with that as well. This is me personally. Because um, in a war of independence that we think about, we think about like, you know, the mass movement, a lot of people who are involved, um, you know, but that wasn't a, like a, a thought, thought through um, and the process of liberating India. It just, it just, you know, it just came about some grieving, and then uh, some people tried to uh, get the British out of India, and then they got, uh, they, they got what happened to them. Uh, so basically, I think, you know, there's going to be this debate uh, going on. I don't think anybody can uh, come up with something that everybody will be happy about. 
Any other questions? I'd just like to say that there's an Indian filmmaker called Amir Khan who has made a fantastic film about called Mutiny, which gives a fairly accurate, I think, description of it. Mm. Do you know what the film's called? I think it's called Mutiny. Called Mutiny? Okay, I'll, I'll By Amir Khan. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, thank you. Before I invite the last person, I just want to say some of the other authors, they couldn't make it here, and they're really sorry that they couldn't make it here. And some, uh, two of them, just uh, um, um, something happened, so they were planning to come. Um, after something in the last week, so they, they, they can't make it. Um, just want to say uh, two things before I invite the last person, is that once he finishes, then we have a performance, drama performance, based on some of the stories. Uh, so he really enjoy the performance. Um, I was the project manager, or project coordinator of the project, and uh, during the process of uh, delivering the project, we organized the training and giving people their um, travel money and things like that. Yeah. I became interested myself, so I tried to write a history, sorry, historical fiction, a fiction for the first time since primary school days. So my fiction is uh, page 111, it's based on you know, in 1607, East India Company decided to build their own ships. Prior to that, they were like leasing or you know, they purchased ships. And two, the first ships coming out of the depth for the ship here, uh, they were called uh, Peppercorn and uh, Trade's Increase. Peppercorn was 300 ton, Trade Increase was uh, more than 1100 ton. Um, and the three ships sailed in 1610, and the trade sinkers was launched by King James um, in, you know, uh, near Deptford. Uh, it sailed in 1610, and there was a long journey, there was a lot of uh, things happened, and you can read the captain's journal and, and other people who were on the different ships, you know, the three ships, uh, and the um, trade sinkers got destroyed while they were being repaired, and what is a green, you know, there's a tiny city on the shore of an island in the current day Indonesia near Bantam. People say Bantam here, but they say Bantam. And, and the death of the captain, you know, soon after the destruction of this ship, the biggest ship England ever built by that time was called Trade's Increase. So my story is based on the destruction of the ship and the death of the captain. And I try to be um, as accurate as possible historically. A few things you have to add. Uh, can I invite Kalam now? Sometimes it's good to wait for the last. <laughs> um, hello everyone. Um, I go by Mosulman Kalam on this uh, project here. Uh, in my day job, I'm a children's librarian, so it's nice to do kind of literature, but really my writing is not for youth, maybe 16 year old plus, but it's quite heavy, dark kind of um, access to history. And the heritage funded project that Mohammed Abdullah allowed us to do was, I understand it was 19 different archives in and around London, including this space as well. And we got to research, like, um, in depth, like, so much, it was incredible. And it's, I'm so appreciative to Mohamed Adela to organise this and being the, sort of the brainchild of this kind of project. And then there's also a drama group, there's other things like that as well. So, and thank you very much for Jean and uh, other, and Caroline as well for organising for us to be here. And, um, um, you know, like, um, I was just saying thank you for that as well and uh, working with other authors as well. So there's different levels of uh, writers as well, but the quality coming out is, is worth looking at. And um, I'm, I'm on page 131, it's called Hustle and the Last Girl Shuffle, Define the Hands of Time. And for me, it was like a playful way of being free within like factual, how I did it was I did research on factual information, mainly the British Library, and then there's the Bermondsey Library that I went to in another space as well, I went to the London Metropolitan Archive. And um, um, uh, I went to quite a few other places as well and used the internet to research as well. And um, um, it was interesting, fascinating, finding different things related to my own history, related to my own heritage as well. And it's quite interesting how some of the authors decided to write in a certain way where it made it more palatable for anyone and everyone to sort of approach it. And, um, you know, hard truths as well, but, you know, it's something to be celebrated as well. And if you make a reference to like, a, do we, you know, I'm starting to begin to archive and document sort of uh, some things I do. 
uh, I've, lect I've recorded and archived um, two lectures at the Imperial War Museum now, and um, you can go and access them as well. Uh, you look for Abdul Kalam Aziz, you can film, find it in the Film and Sound Archive. But it's starting to just begin to these unearthing these truths. And uh, I'm going to give you different accents as well. Now the reason why is because uh, there's a thing called like Jack Tars, so the sailors that were on the top deck, they would be bare-backed and they'd have a, a tar painting their bell bottoms. And so my notion of the, trying to find out the truth is difficult to find. But I think the reason why it's bell bottoms is because when they go into the, into the water with tar painted on their trousers, they'll just sink to the bottom. And the thing about it is that they'll be bare-backed, so these jack tars would actually um, you know, be tanned because of the sun hitting their uh, skin. So, you know, to some, like a Lascar, like a, a maybe like a Muslim or Hindu or, you know, an Asian diaspora kind of um, sailor, they were called Lascars. Some of them were Chinese as well, uh, or Oriental, and um, they were called Lascars. But they were known to be five times lesser paid, but uh, five times hard working. Uh, the Lascars were known for that. And the thing about it is that, um, uh, you know, I, I see uh, stories of the Imperial War Museum as well, more modern as well, where, you know, the Lascars or stayed on board while everyone else jumped ship. Uh, they're waiting for the captain after he got attacked. So these, it shows like the noble and like very submissive types of personalities that were on board. Now this character, uh, it's a fictional playful thing, so he kind of ju jumps from multiple jobs. Mm. And there's a thing called the Letter of Marquis. And it gave, it was like, I called it, I said like it was the United Letter of Marquis was given to a ship called the Broxenbury. And um, it gave the ship, uh, a, mil a military merchant ship, the license to kill. And that's what it was. So in a way, it's like the modern day James Bond or the earlier James Bond. That's what, it th what I thought. And the comical way I put it, I said, look, you know, like 007, well, this is the original 00. <laughs> and so the ACS detectives, uh, you know, the man from Auntie, and, uh, he, had, he had a Mission Impossible. And then what it is, he, he's basically, um, you know, he could go further and like it's comical things within it. It's quite humorous. but. Remember, it's like quite playful, so it's kind of fiction, like pushing the boundaries of fiction. I, I asked uh, Muhammad, look, could I go a bit science fiction? He goes, no, 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 no not science fiction, please. You know, so, <laughs> so I held back, so uh, Muhammad uh, sort of held me back a bit. So I'm going to playful, uh, do playful accents, and uh, I've done something new as well, I'm going to try a different accent, but you can get an idea of a flavour where he's a Lascar, but he played the tabla, okay? And so there was a, he had a friend who had a violin, like a, uh, an Irish violinist or fiddle player, and he would team up with this character and just keep the, sh the sailors ship shape and jolly and you know keep them entertained so you've got a bit of entertainment coming and uh, you can ask the characters questions later on as well so you might you might say could ask this character this question or that sort of thing so um so here we go so this is a new character i've uh, decided so this guy in bengali is called um uh david full of atoms so in, in, the, in the kind of colloquial local translation would be david atombura Okay, so it goes. <laughs> okay, that's a Bengali translation, semantics, it goes across that way. So it goes, it goes, now here we are, on the canopy, on the precipice of civilization, and what we have here presented here to you today in this modern day age, is it 2017? Yes, uh, Market Drayton, meandering amongst the minions, here presented to you today is Muscle Man Kalam giving you some entertainment, leisurely whispers of words. And we have here, what we have here is a gentleman who's called Idris Alba. And he played along, the, you know Idris Alba, he, he had a notion of South Africa. It was, it was called the Horn of Africa at the time. And I'll give you a sample. A long road to freedom, my friends, has been an arduous one. But it has not been a waste of time for me. Because after 28 years of what they saw, social designs at council estates, is that a meteorite over a minaret? Is that a moon in your top pocket? Is that the four moons of time, Big Ben, type of encapsulation? They allowed me a freedom pass and much more. <laughs> so, and then I'll give you an Irish accent as well. So the Irish accent is, um, okay, so look, imagine a Lusco traveling around in London. Mm. And he's on the cobble streets and that sort of thing. So how does he survive? So, you know, like, uh, this goes like this goes. So I'll just go straight to the character. He goes, good evening to you all. I be a Bengali leprechaun. A Bengali leprechaun is what I be. You see, it's the beard, the fictional beard that gives it away. The great, the fictional green entire match in trainers. I be a Bengali leprechaun. Now, if you find me on the cobble streets of London, what I say is, I'm not Muslim. I'm a Bengali leprechaun. <laughs> and on a serious note, I'd like to pose the question. Why would one go to such extremes? And then I'm going to break into song like this. 
It's a Bengali song, but it's also an English song. And my wife said about filming, she doesn't like it, but I'll just, I'll carry on. So it goes like this. I'm a Judy, here I am, Dowry, dear Tom. Oi, by me, Shuki, see me alone. Oi, no hota, here I love him, Shai. Manusha Rokta, Oi, no hota, Rokta, love him, Shai. Sinia Sabata. If I gave you diamonds and dowry, would you be a happy serial honest? It's about the blood in your diamonds and the sugar in your blood. Not quite the diamond in the rough, but the jewel in the crown. Not quite the temperera, but the tea I hold to. I'm a dushki, to my dushki. Tara dushki, amra dushki, gasara zontro, gasara zontro, sare ga, sare ga, ai u babi bo, shore o rosho i dirko din, baula gam, azar salam, henne hamra, gunagar, gunagar, I'm not to blame, you're not to blame. We're not to blame, they're not to blame. There you go, leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just, uh, how do you say it? Face to last or something like that? Face to last. Face to last. Any question for uh, Calab? Would you maybe like to ask David Attenborough questions? <laughs> <laughs> I think no questions. Uh, I'm just going to invite Shannon. Uh, she will take over now and she will introduce uh, this short performance that uh, you really enjoy. It, so I think. Yes, you will. Are you Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, two sets. I'm doing like so many hats. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Dr. Jalen Sully, and I am a theatre writer and director and academic. And um, I have been involved. I don't know. I think it's um. Turn me on. I have been commissioned by Brick Lane Circle and Amadilla Bay to um, take, initially, take all 14 stories, I think they were, and put them into, uh, to dramatise them, basically. Which is no easy feat, because some stories are difficult to dramatise. So we, um, which is fine, uh, we did it, and the performance that we had initially was just over an hour in length. And we had e extracts of each of the stories. Today we're going to give you a slimmed down version of um, four of the stories that are going to be enacted. And one that was um, Amadilabe's actual story that was very difficult to put into any kind of dramatic manner on stage because it was about a big ship. So <laughs> what I did was I worked with a, um, a group of boys in an Islamic faith school and we did stop frame animation. And we, um, they, they built all the set, the ships, everything, and they filmed it and they edited it themselves. So you'll see that as the final story after our dramatization. Um, I'm going to introduce each one. Are they all in place? Guys, can you take your positions, please? Thank you. Um, I, we are, okay, let me just introduce you to my actors, first of all. Um, my um, actors are um, Ramika. Ramika has um, was in the original production. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Ramika is not actually from the east end of London. Ramika's from the west. 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 Far west. But Ramika, um, I met Ramika through one of my students that I teach at um, Richmond University. And she um, came on board to another project that we did with um, Brick Lane Circle. And then she stayed on and did all the other projects that I've done, basically. This way included. Um, then I've got Tasnia. Tasnia is one of my students in, in Tower Hamlet. Um, she's been in a couple of our productions. Already. She's also in the original performance, but she wasn't playing the parts that she's playing today. So she was playing a much um, uh, less of a principal role. So today she's really like stepped up. <laughs> Where's Tasnia? Tasnia, come forward. Tasnia is Tasnia's sister. <laughs> Name is a bit confusing. Um, Tasmia is also a member of, a, she's a, my volunteer for the um, Youth Arts organisation that I work for in Tower Hamlets. Um, so I work for Tower Hamlets um, Youth Services as, um, as a council employee. Um, and basically she's involved in the performances and um, she does other things as well um, in our productions. So she said, yes, I'll get, I'll get on board with this. Why not? Brilliant. And um, Pierre. Yeah. Pierre is um, one of my students from Richmond University because I teach at uh, Richmond University of American Liberal Arts. And um, the original production, I had three, three um, students from the university, but they've all graduated. And Pierre hasn't graduated yet, so I, you know, I put it out there and he said, why not? And Pierre is... <laughs> Pierre is um, what is it, half American, half French, um, but his family lives in Portugal, so he's <laughs> <it's> like, well, <laughs> I want to see some you know, different places. Oh, yes. This is great for him. Thank you, Pierre. And Rada, who you've already met, Rada's going to do a little cameo performance for us um, as Rani, who's one of the authors. In the original, I had a few of the other authors. Um, in the productions, but they've all let me down, so go <laughs> there. Okay, I'm just going to set up. Um, I'll be sitting here with the slides. The first production, the first um, piece is. If you look at the banner here, Vijaya, um, you can read it afterwards, but um, Saga wrote this, and um, this is the story of Jack and Vic, and their travels to India and the difficulties that they faced along the way. So, here we go. Oh, okay. My name's Jack. I'm a rope tire. This year, rope's made out of hemp. It was one of the strongest plants in the world. I needed the money. I have a beautiful wife called Victoria back home, and we needed the money. And that's how I got mixed with Davy Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Davy! What have you done to my Jack? Your Jack is until tomorrow afternoon to give me my money. I'll give you the money. I promise. This is your last chance, Jack. I want it tomorrow. Mm. Why didn't you tell me he was friending you? I borrowed a bit of money from him, but then he said he wanted more interest, and then he said he would go after you if I said anything else. How much money you got left, Dave? I had to pay the tickets for India. We don't have much left. My friends from the Navy say that the cost of living in India is much cheaper, so it won't be too much of a problem. We can, we all have enough to provide for ourselves, and we'll be okay. A girl with a kick like that, I reckon. Let's we'll take after her mum. <laughs> Land ahoy! Oh! oh. Jack! Oh! Oh! Okay. So, oh! Take care. Jack, Victoria's pain is not subsiding. 
example. What happens if we can't reduce the pain then? She may not be able to make it. Her and the baby. Breathe. 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 Doc, there's this book I've been reading. Your wife is having a baby, and you're telling me you have read a book. No, 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 Doc. There's this herb. It says that it can help reduce pain. Where have you read about that? I bought the book at the Shema Bazaar. The author said that it reduces pain. What is the name of the herb? Give me the herb! <laughs> <laughs> Go to the town of Rajbari. Look for a man called Zafar. He'll be able to help you. Tell him I sent you there. Yes. <laughs> yes, how may I help you? Dr. Gar Swami sent me. He says that you have an herb that cures pain. Ah, oh, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> One drop on the tongue. Yeah. No more. Yeah. Right you are. Thank you. <gasps> yes. out of Jack. What I make my ropes out of? Yes, Jack. The plant called him. <laughs> what would we call her, Jack? How about him? Look at her. She's as strong as her mother. I say we call her Victoria. <sighs> Otherwise known as Amala, the sister of Ali Wardi Khan, the Nawab of Bengal, and the traitorous betrayal of her husband against her family. Karima, what are you doing? You have Alverdi is the guest of honor. You can't serve the same as the same as everyone else. <laughs> I squeezed this lid myself. Just before the party, I added a bit of pistachio, just the way you like it. <laughs> we know the rooms are first, and I'm sorry to say. Uh, but I was unable to fend off against Mia Halili and the Afghans from Minapur and Orissia. I forgive you, Ali. I never believed the rumors anyway, and... Stop! This is my husband, Ali. Nawab Ali Vadi is my brother. But recently I found out that my husband is not all that he seems. You see, in our room, I found this letter, which was written in my husband's hand. The letter made no sense. Let me read it to you. Dear Amala, I'm writing this letter for you because I want to plan a feast as a way of apologizing and acknowledging my mistake. The guest of honor would be our dear brother, Nawab Alivadi. I understand why Alibadi dismissed me. He has many worries as his... Forget it. Arrange dinner plans with him at a time around 8pm because 
That is his everyday routine, every night. He likes drinking milk. Make sure that is there. I remember the disaster happened last time. He forgot. Thing is, I know he's fussy when he eats. I want a mix of people at the dinner. No one with poison mind. Good people at the dinner. Coriander with the food because that is his favorite. You will be at charge. Will you handle everything? Get this done, please. The pressure is on. Remainder to yourself that of all parties thrown, yours should be the best. Payment is no problem after all. Your brother, the ever victorious, is Nawab, ruler of Bengal. Is that clear? The dead should regret missing the party. MJ Ali. Well, this letter made no sense. My, husband pen, my husband's penmanship is excellent. And this letter was full of mistakes. Perhaps it was in code. The first misspelled word was four. I decided to underline every fourth word in the letter. And rereading it revealed his true intentions. What am I going to do? I cannot stop my husband. It is too late. But I have a plan. I think you should let Ali have the first sip of your milk. If you have forgiven him, my brother. I think you should feed Ali the milk with your own hands. <laughs> Drink, my dear husband. This pistachio milk must be very delicious, because I know all that you're capable of. Ah. Thank you, Amalia. This milk was quite delicious. I especially loved how you fed it to me. It made the pistachio milk even more delightful. Why are you sitting here tonight? I miss you in my... I miss your presence in my... I mean, outer room. I especially loved it. How it was romantic it was that like you gave me a cup of milk in your own hands. Why are you afraid of me? It's me, Ali, your husband. Hmm. Can I ask you a question? Why is it that you wanted me to drink the milk? After I finished it, you looked so shocked. Oh no, you also wanted to drink it yourself. Am I right? I'm sorry, Don. It's just that the cup of milk was just too die for. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think there was something wrong with the milk then? Did you? No, you couldn't. Otherwise, you would have stopped me from drinking it in the first place. I think you know very much well what I can do. Now we need to live with that. You should always know I will be always one step ahead of you no matter what you do and what you say. After all, you are a woman. My son now acts with my eyes and my ears when I'm not around. He overheard your conversation with the servant. He fetched me the letter, and then, with the evidence, I burned it. You women are no match for us men. But, in any case, you made me realize something earlier today. Brother Ali Videri has been incredibly helpful. I need him for his support and his contacts. I can't let anything happen to him. At least for now, that is. <laughs> what you did today was very bold, but you must remember who you're dealing with, and that is Mayor Jafar Ali Khan.
Um, I believe the uh, you all know that um, back in the days, um, if a man died, his wife would be burned with him. And I think it's in the um, so this is the tale of Rani who was on her way to be burned with her husband. The opium cloud stupor disengages my mind from my body. As I gaze down at the wretched, semi-somnolent, crimson-clad form, bound in one last unwilling embrace to her dead husband, and the harsh ropes rasp against my wrists and ankles, beading them in thin bracelets of blood, I realise I am that woman, I am that sati, that virtuous wife that burns with her dead husband to cleanse him of all sin. <coughs> but he saved me. He pulled me from the funeral pyre, but only because his company rules permitted it. He believes our religion to be steeped in superstition and priestly tyranny, yet he and his countrymen allow our women to burn, as long as it is done in accordance to the Hindu scriptures, which they supposedly scorn. Does he really think that Sita had any choice but to throw herself into the flames when Rama doubted her fidelity? I wanted to show this benign, benevolent, ignorant man, that I can step outside of Sita's circle. Some 20 years later, he had amassed enough to purchase a small estate back home. He hesitantly asked me to accompany him, unsure of my response. He sailed away from Calcutta's shores, assured that he was leaving these lands under a more benevolent government than they had ever before enjoyed. Of me though, he was never certain. He was asking me to leave these lands of jeweled colours, tropical warmth, familiar tastes and subtle smells. My land of 13 rivers and seven seas to join him on his bleak island home. I keep myself and my soul from his grasping God. But he saved my life after all. I can never give him the affection he earns. But my body can travel with him over black waters. I own that much at least. of the Nawab Kamran, an insolent Nawab who unsuccessfully conspired against the East India Company. Why have you captured Lakshi? <laughs> Why? She's a great fighter. It took us over an hour to capture her and her well-trained troop. It was a pleasure to fight her. She may look innocent and fragile, but she has immense strength and a fighting spirit to resist all men. She injured most of my soldiers in that fight. Previously, I admired her for her beauty, but I'm only enraptured by her other talent. This is political madness. How can you go and capture the daughter of the Rai Zamindari? Why are you so bothered by this? <clears throat> I remember that incident. One evening, when I was returning home with my troops, after hunting in the forest, I was lost in my thoughts. I did not notice I was lagging far behind my troops. 
Suddenly, I heard the call of a distant bird. I jumped off my horse and began following that sound. There in the bushes was a beautiful white peacock. But there was a sound and the bird flew away. I tried to follow it, but a snowflake was flying in my direction. I grabbed it with my hands and I realized it was not a snowflake, but a white peacock's feather. A twig broke behind me and suddenly two veiled men were standing in front of me, their swords ready to strike. They robbed me of my jewels and they were about to hurt me when I saw her, a beautiful woman, the air blowing through her hair, her eyes shining like black diamonds. Who was she, I wondered? Was she my beautiful peacock, now in the form of a woman? <coughs> or was she some Hindu Devi? Suddenly, swords clashed. She took on the decoy from the back, and I stood there looking for my sword. Then I realized she was coming in my direction. She handed me the sword and stared expectantly at my other hand. I extended the peacock's feather in a silent thank you. Look, I'll make you a deal. Let him actually go free, and I'll help you fight your Firangi. Really? Do you swear by it? Upon my honor, I swear it. Very well. You may release her. I need you more than I need her. Hilakshi, you're free to go. I may not be able to see you again. I now have to help Kamran fight the East India Company. You may not like my decision, just like your mother, but I do not have many choices. I'm not like those other princes who fight for wealth or for glory. But being the only son of the King of Dumrao, I do not have any other choices. But before we depart, I must let you know. Since I've been in the forest, you've always been in my thoughts. I've been looking out for you, and all my thoughts are captured in this letter. I just have one question for you. Have I ever come in your thoughts? And if I have, will you wait for my return? I've lost all my estates. Everything that once belonged to me now belongs to the East India Company. And what of Nawab Kamran? Oh, he and his men, they were killed on the second day of the battle. He did not know <clears throat> that he was betrayed by the very people that he had trusted so much. Muhammad Amir betrayed Nawab Kamran for only 30,000 rupees from the East India Company. I must now take your leave. Thank you for all your hospitality. Oh, how is Ilakshi doing after being released from Nawab Kamran's palace? Oh, Ilakshi, she hasn't returned to the palace since her release. How can that be? Oh, I've searched for her everywhere, everywhere. I can't find her. My heart is heavy. I'm really afraid for her life. I am. I make you a vow. I'll look for her day and night. And until I find her, I'll not return to the palace. Oh, son, perhaps you can help me. Oh, I'm tired and weary. Can you? Help me carry my things, maybe. I need to get home before sunset. Well, where do you live? Just on the edge of the forest. So what are you going to be doing with all these leaves and twigs? Oh, these are medicines. 
I must get them to her quickly. Oh, she's in a lot of pain. Who? Your daughter? Oh no. She's like my daughter. She would come around the forest. We would call her the forest queen, Bono Kenya. You know, she was she was very good archery, very good at archery. And my husband would teach her uh, swords, swordsmanship. So it's, very, it's a shame she lost her hearing at such a young age. But, you know, she was so good with the sword. I do not know who would dare to harm her like this. Who was her father? The the Vaj, the Vaj, the, Divaj, Divaj. the commander of the Raisa Mindari. Yes, yes. She that was the Devaj's daughter. Yes. Look, she's in so much pain. We must get her. Milakshi! Milakshi! Thank you and really nice. You can do your um, Can I get the actors up on stage for a bow? I would love to have a ship like that. I mean, 
prayer continues. Perhaps he cannot find King James of my wish to have a ship of equal splendor. Sir, I will inform His Majesty of your wish. Let us eat. Early next morning, Captain Middleton and three of us will <coughs> take a walk to check on the repairs to the tracing piece. Whoa! Man overboard! Steady! Steady! Sir, I'm worried. I'm worried about careening the ship. I don't think it would be so stable on its side. The last two times we tried this, many sailors died. I believe that it's going to take many more months to fix it. Let's stop him, Mr. You have one month and no more. I must return to England. into their curriculum, um, which is ironic really when they've taken the arts out of the curriculum in most of the schools across England, but it's another issue. Um, so it, I thought they did so well. They made all the sets themselves, they filmed it, they scripted it, and they did um, a lot of the editing, though Nigel um, Holloway, who's an amazing um, filmmaker and youth, youth officer, um, helped them along the way because this is what he does. So um, I think they did really well, and then and they actually came to the event and watched their piece being, you know, appreciated by everyone, so it was really good. So I'll let them know that, you know, we've shown it here as well. Thank you. And actually, Janet, it really and truly, you covered something that I was going to say in just my closing speech, and to thank you, is that this has really been a very cultural media um, presentation this afternoon, which, uh, given that this the whole reason that we are here today, is because of Marty Great Arts Festival. Yes. So I think really and truly, we have covered a lot of different media yes. um, Film, theatre, creative writing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. More, than, yeah. more and more than appropriate. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to have the, the mayor here today. Um, would, you, would you like to just come in through and have a few words? Just a few words. I've thoroughly enjoyed this afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Amdala and the authors. I look forward to being and reading the book. The production was very, very good. Thank you very much. The stop frame, stop frame was excellent too. And I believe you're going to thank it. Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and then the new year. Well, I hope they enjoyed much of you this afternoon. So it's still a big round of applause for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
one last comment, if I could just have a minute of your time. Another aspect of our legacy from Robert Clive is that Market Dragon is twinned with Paysanas in southern France, which I expect a lot of you know. If it happens that you know someone who'd be interested in knowing about the twinning, or you yourself would like to know something, these leaflets are available at the desk as you go out, and it gives you information about how to get in touch with the officers of Market Drayton Paysanas Twinning. Okay, thank you. We should be twins with India. <laughs> Maybe, yes. <laughs> Yeah.